Costa. Hi, I'm your neighbor from across the burning lake. Just moved in a few months ago. Uh, what? I just want to ask you to move that disgusting pile of woo you have on your front lawn. I'm not gonna go outside. Do you see it? It's raining. I'm gonna get wet. Also, I will get the sunburn in 30 seconds. So, no way. It smells like aborted Jesus' morning breath, and I think it's starting to spread. Oh, it can't be that bad. Come on, join me. Have a cup of tea, some red velvet cookies, a few tears of the dam. What's the best argument you've ever heard for the existence of God? Whoa, this is a big bunch of woo-woo. Look, just do something with it, or I'm hosing it with holy water and calling the rabbi. Wait, <laughs> what? We've seen that evolution just isn't logical. Uh, not sure I agree, but logical or illogical is utterly irrelevant. All that matters is whether or not it is true. We've also seen the consequences of applying that worldview. No, 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 stop right there. I'm sorry for not letting you finish your sentence, but you're conflating two concepts here already. Evolution is a process occurring in nature. It is not a worldview. There might be worldviews that use it as a basis to create some woo-woo system that they then adhere to, but that worldview itself is not evolution. It is sort of like how Jews, Christian, Mormons, and Muslims all take the concept of God and go haywire with it. Some add so much woo-woo to it that at some point they get obsessed with how many steps they can walk out on a particular day to not enrage Sky Daddy, who for some reason doesn't seem to care any other day or time. Or some obsessed with which foot you have to enter the bloody bathroom first to make sure that the angels are the ones watching you pee rather than the jeans. Now, granted, the analogy is not perfect because God is a far more abstract and generic term, it's not an actual occurring process in nature, but it still showcases how different ideologies and worldviews can be, in spite of sharing the one core concept. It devalues the weak, the needy, and the different. The horrors of genocide and racism thrive in a worldview that espouses the survival of the fittest. Kind of like the mark of Cain refers to dark skin and therefore anyone capable of producing melanin is inferior? Huh? No. Of course not. The same way the old biblical story could be twisted to serve the needs of some nasty people, evolution can be twisted to serve the needs of nasty people too. The key word here is twisted, because just like the mark of Cain had no specification added and thus could be very opportunistically interpreted, the word fittest was not specific enough either and thus was opportunistically misinterpreted too. I mean, even as you talk in the video, I could bet on it that to you the word fittest gets equated to best or most superior, which it is not. In fact, fittest means different things within the same continent. If you live near the ocean, you're fitter if your body can digest fish well. Whereas if you live in relatively dry grassland, you'd be far, far fitter if you would digest buffalo well instead. I mean, when you get right down to it, evolution isn't actually survival of the fittest. That was something Herbert Spencer coined to show the indifference of nature. Evolution is the survival of, well, I guess you'll do. Meaning that if you survive to reproduce, you cleared the bar, and whatever advantage you had, minor though it may be, is going to be passed on. Even something as superficial as skin tone can be an evolutionary trait. Or why not? Let's take skin for an example, since we're talking about that. If you live in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, you're much, much better off with a skin that produces a decent amount of melanin, otherwise you'll get a sunburn every time you leave your house. However, in the northern territories of Canada, there is so little sun most of the time that the only way your skin can produce any vitamin D is if you turn translucent. As soon as you would move the fittest for survival of northern Canada down to Mexico and vice versa, they would both no longer be the fittest. And yet they haven't changed at all. They're merely in a different place. Survival of the fittest and superior kind of human do not make sense together. They do not compute in evolution. What's the best argument you've ever heard for the existence of God? Maybe you've never heard any arguments. Well, sit back and ask yourself one question. Which came first? Which do you think came first in the evolutionary process? The retinas or the cornea? The retina, of course. That's a hard one. No, it's not. It's the retina. 
Look, the first precursors of our current retina were flat and on the surface, not internal and not inverted. Since the survival of the fittest meant that the better an organism could see, the better it was at escaping predators or catching prey, that also meant that you got more and more organisms with better and better eyes over time, and less and less organisms with bad or no eyes, except of course in places where seeing was not an advantage. Once the retina was evolved to the point where it was internal, there was a need and a chance to protect it and optimize it, so the cornea started to evolve. After all, if seeing well makes you fit for survival, then protecting your sight and seeing sharper makes you even fitter for survival. Which one of these do you think evolved first? The bones, the ligaments, tendons, or the blood supply to muscles to move the bones? The blood. All animals, from the monocellular to the whale, need to have access to oxygen and nutrition and to get rid of carbon dioxide. Otherwise, they get hyper and run around hysterically before collapsing and ceasing to be. Ish. Now, if an animal is very, very small, it doesn't need a heart to pump nutrients around or bones or ligaments or tendons or any of that nonsense. All it needs is a bit of goop inside that gets wobbled around and brings you nutrients from A to B. So, a primitive variation of blood. Only once you get to bigger organisms, you need a bit more sophistication. I mean, try pumping your nutrient goop up the neck of a giraffe without a pumping mechanism and a super tiny tube that contains it. It would be a nightmare. Oh my gosh, this is hard. <sighs> I kind of feel for these students, really. Walking about your day, <laughs> thinking about the next party or the next test, and someone just completely throws you off. I mean, if you were to ask me about power tools and I'm done recording this video, for example, I would probably go cross-eyed. Even though in any situation where I would actually need the power tools, I would have absolutely no problem at all with those questions. I'm willing to bet that none of them are bio majors. What do you think of all first? The immune system or the need for an immune system? The need for an immune system. Now what I'd like to know is, what was created first, our appendix or ability not to need it? I have no idea. Oh come on! Think about it! If we wouldn't have all sorts of parasite and harmful germs around us, an immune system would have never been advantageous to develop because there wouldn't have been need for one. There would have been no benefit for having one. It doesn't even require an understanding of evolution. An understanding of any history will help. Software, what came first? Computer viruses or antiviruses? Military history, what came first? Body armor or bullets that needed armor to be blocked? Hell, what came first? Home security or the need for home security? Okay. That's why I dropped the class. So, <laughs> that's why you dropped the class, yeah, right. That is kind of sad, actually. Don't get me wrong. If you struggle to follow a subject, it's good to find something that suits you better. More power to you. But how messed up are universities if their students struggle with this sort of question? I mean, this is no advanced hyper-complicated biology woo-woo. It's a very, very simple logical puzzle that only requires a very, very basic concept of evolution. It takes an uneducated pleb like me about five seconds to solve it, and yet our most trained and educated youngsters cannot do it. It's crazy. What is irreducible complexity and how does it confirm a biblical creation? I'm not gonna ask him about the veins and the bones, are you? And where did you learn to ask questions this way? Pravda? How does it confirm a biblical creation presupposes an entire rabbit hole of unproven assumptions. First of all, you have to assume that irreducible complexity is a real thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't say it does confirm it you'd say it would confirm it. And regardless of whether or not the existence of irreducible complexity is true, you can't just pretend that it is from the get-go. You have to give a basis for it. Second, you explicitly ask how it confirms the biblical creation, but never actually establish if it confirms it. And the third assumption is a whole assumption. 
It doesn't just confirm the existence of irreducible complexity, it also apparently confirms that it's permanent, that it is and was and always will be irreducibly complex, that it was created, that there was only one possible mechanism to create it, and that said mechanism is none other than your favorite spice of divine creation, the biblical creation. And those are just assumptions I've picked up right away and I bet I've missed some comment in the section below which ones I missed and how horrible I am for having overseen them. Irreducible complexity is when you have a machine where you have multiple parts that work together and they have to all basically be working in order for the whole to function. Machine parts such as heart and bones, yeah, very humanizing way to look at people, isn't it, Mr. Homo Machinensis? Like a bike. So, yeah, like a bicycle, absolutely. A bicycle. Of all the things that you could have picked, you used a bicycle. There is a hell of a lot of reducible complexity on a bicycle, my dear friend. So you need the pedals. Nope. And you need the chain. Nope. And you need the wheels. Those, maybe yes. Two of them, in fact. Otherwise, it would be a monocycle, not a bicycle. Uh, unicycle, he said. It'd be a unicycle. <laughs> Nitpicker. And you need the handlebars. Uh, debatable. It's like with the reins of a horse. You can use them, but you could also not. You could also just use your weight and, you know, not pull around on that poor animal's mouth all that much. And I mean... If we were to go one step lower with unicycles, you typically wouldn't even have handlebars. Uh, you could probably get away without a steering wheel too. Or if turning around corners just overrated, two fixed wheels will get you where you want to go as long as the wear is in front of you. True. Or alternatively, if you have the pedals attached to the front wheel and allow that wheel to turn, you could in theory use your legs and the pedals to steer. A bit inconvenient, but doable. If you're lacking any one of those components, then the whole does not function as a whole. If you take off the chain, the bike won't function as a bike. Therefore, irreducible complexity. Smartest thing I've ever heard. Now, granted, it won't work exactly like before, but with a few tweaks here and there, a bike with no chain will do just fine and still be a bike. Irreducible complexity of bikes disproven. Try again, buddy. I think they forgot the most crucial component to a bike, the frame. Because uh, no argument for me if you say a bike without its frame isn't actually a bike. Shh! Don't do his work for him, you! Somebody had to create this thing, and they had to create it with all the parts already working together in order right. for it to function. Well, considering that a bike is not a living and self-replicating organism, it would be rather odd to see it build itself. But that obvious flaw of the analogy aside, isn't it odd how nowadays we have all these intricate parts like gears and brakes, whereas the original bike didn't even have pedals? I mean, in spite of you choosing such a far-fetched example devoid of any, well, life for a start, you still managed to shoot yourself in the foot by choosing an example that had a massive developmental curve that on top of that has been very well documented. Yes, the current eyes are massively complex, but they evolved from very, very simple light sensors. Yes, the current bike has all these hyper suspenders and mega gears and whatever knickknack you put on it. But it got developed and refined from a glorified piece of wood attached to two wheels. It basically evolved. I swear, they have to invent a new sort of grade for you. Because you didn't fail. You succeeded at anti-succeeding. Somehow. I can show you a video of a bike being produced. I could point you towards some bike factories too. Uh, can you show me God's human factories? And if you point me towards the nearest woman, I'm going to ask where the reproductive component of a bike is. Uh, hey, at least he figured out what the woman is. <clears throat> If he points to the nearest woman, he's implying that she's God because other than her body, nobody's working on the baby right now, is it? And the other thing about that is living things tend to be irreducibly complex. The same way bikes are irreducibly complex? Something as simple as a bacteria is irreducibly complex. Alright, let me get this straight. You went all around to ask people what evolved before and then introduced the Christian equivalent of a CNN expert to us to talk about irreducible complexity 
which did not connect whatsoever to the questions you asked before, and we are supposed to sit there and understand what you're on about? What is the thought process behind this? Students of who knows what faculty or subjects don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Therefore, irreducible complexity. Is that a thought process? How does that make any sense to you? You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and say that it doesn't. Someone simply told you that that is the way to think about it. And that if you hear X, the answer is gamma, and that's as far as the thought process in your brain goes. Well, in his defense, his channel is called Road Trip to Truth, not Fastest Route to Truth. And uh, as we all know, road trips are about the journey, not the destination. <laughs> It's got DNA in it, but DNA can't just exist by itself. DNA uh, requires enzymes to maintain it and to replicate it. Where do the enzymes come from? There are structures that produce those. Where does, where does the information to produce these enzymes come from? Well, it comes from the DNA. So the enzymes need the DNA, and the DNA needs the enzymes. Got it. Congratulations! You have just contradicted the first law of thermodynamics. DNA can't just poof enzymes into existence out of nowhere. Sure, you need enzymes as a sort of catalyst to get your body to function properly, but enzymes are nothing more than a particular subset of proteins, and proteins don't need DNA to exist. It's like saying you wouldn't exist without words because you need them to communicate, and words wouldn't exist without you because your mouth flapping is what produces words in the first place. And the fact that there are people who do not do any mouth flapping or do not hear any mouth flipping seems just to rush right past you. And so I have to ask, which one evolved first? And the answer is, he, it doesn't even make sense. They had to have been created working simultaneously. Uh, 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 hold it right there. You're so close to the answer. Let me fix it for you. And so I have to ask, which one evolved first? And the answer is, he, it doesn't even make sense. They had to have been evolved working simultaneously. Yes, there are things that develop simultaneously. Now, of course, you can't just acknowledge that because it would discredit your belief and close to true is still not actually true, but hey, you were close nonetheless. Which do you think of all first? The lungs, the mucus lining to protect them, the throat, or the perfect mixture of gases in the atmosphere to be breathed into those lungs? Do you even listen to yourself? The perfect mixture of gases? <sighs> <sighs> Look, if there was enough access to oxygen, we wouldn't need any lungs in the first place. And we wouldn't have any right now either. I mean, think about it. Earthworms can just sit there and breathe through the skin. But we have to waste this massive amount of space in our chest for an organ whose sole purpose is to separate oxygen from the air to give it to us to use. That is how perfect the whole system is. I mean, it's like saying that Texas weather is perfectly adapted to the air conditioner. Unreal! <laughs> no, I don't know, man. Okay, okay. And there are lots of systems like that, things that work together. You know, you have your, your heart, which pumps blood. Well, you need a blood system for that to work. Which, which, which evolved first, your blood system or your heart? Ugh, your heart. Organisms had a heart before they had a closed blood circulation. Actually, Yusuf, I'm pretty sure blood evolved first since small enough organisms can use diffusion in place of a heart or in place of plants, capillary action. Man, I'm getting to use all sorts of useless high school biology class today. Blood, but not blood systems. You had blood before you had a heart, and you had a heart before you had veins. One could argue that your heart is part of the blood system, or that blood is part of your blood system, and so the question is utterly moot, and one would be absolutely right to point it out, but that's not how our little friend here formulated the question. I am fairly confident that he's talking about our current blood circulation system, with, you know, arteries and all of that, and I'm not sure he understands that blood is part of the equation. Also, Blood was not an option, so I stick with my answer. Heart comes first. <laughs> which, which, which evolved first, your blood system or your heart? Well, they had to have been created. All right, let's play along for a moment, because even in your world, this is utter nonsense. Why has the heart been created alongside veins, alongside lungs and bones and you name it? Why? Why was there a need to create all of that stuff? Why not optimize the air or the gravity to a point where 99% of stuff in our bodies wouldn't even be needed? Whether you acknowledge it or not, we both agree on the principle 
that bodies fit into the environment that surrounds them. The only difference between you and me is that I say that the bodies were the ones to adapt and you say that nature was the one to adapt. And while I have a very easy time to explain about nearly everything that's around us with a very plain basic principle concerning evolution, namely that the need for something causes organisms to adapt, otherwise they get extinct, you on the other hand have created for yourself this massive new set of questions and puzzles as to why there is all this interfungled mess of stuff and you have no answers. You got your kidneys, you got your liver and spleen and all these different parts that work together to make your body possible. That's exactly what I mean. You got the liver, the kidney and the spleen. All three basically hellbound on filtering garbage out of your body. Not to mention the fact that the kidneys are double. Why did Mr. Biblical Creation CEO choose free organs? Why couldn't he put them all together and have a mega clean station, a free in one space saver or something like that? And why is there no intelligence in this intelligent design of yours? Since you're so high horse about all of the answers, how about you answer me those questions? Hmm? Darwin was aware of this issue and he actually promoted it as a potential defeater for his idea. He said, you know, if, if, if it can be shown that any of these systems cannot be produced by gradual small changes, then he says my theory would absolutely break down. And the funny thing is that has now been demonstrated. Yeah, I, I don't think you demonstrated what you think you demonstrated there, mister. Darwin did not say if something is so complicated that you can't simplify it today. His theory is disproven. He said if it can't be shown that you can't get from something simple incrementally to something more complicated to explain the complicated of today, then it is disproven. Listen, uh, Homo Mackinensis, let me explain this to you in a way that you personally understand it. Darwin did not say that if you can't remove the chain from the gears, his idea wouldn't work. He said that if you can't get from simpler models to your current one, i.e. if the model before maybe didn't have four gears but three, and the one before that had one, and the one before that had none, and before that had pedals attached to the wheel, and so on, then it would be disproven. And as you can see, your own example failed to disprove it. So by Darwin's own definition, evolution has already been dismantled. It's been refuted. We now know of a number of systems in the human body and in other organisms that are irreducibly complex. Now. They're complex now. That does not mean that they were complex in your ancestry millions and millions of years ago. And it's ironic because we found that God has encoded the instructions to make you on a molecule. You found that? Really? I don't believe you. Tell me, how exactly did you find that? Did you walk around one Sunday and see biblical creation got scribbled instructions onto molecules or something? Because you see, the problem with written instructions is that it's a little hard to establish the author. I mean, even if you had a note of the DNA that says, made by God, you still couldn't 100% be certain that God was the actual author. What if it was Satan instead? What if he merely signed as God? He would never know. However, all of that is irrelevant because there is no signature in the first place. And unless you caught the DNA writer in the act, which you didn't, you have no way whatsoever to establish the actual author. Which I think that's awesome. That's powerful confirmation of creation. Let us go through that explanation again. Bikes can't lack pedals, therefore irreducible complexity, therefore creator, therefore God. Something being complex doesn't mean it was made. That has to be proven. And it certainly doesn't mean it was made by your favorite Santa Claus. But ironically, the discoverers of DNA were atheists. Yeah. They actually thought that when they found DNA, well, they, we don't need God anymore. Well, I cannot find anything on Friedrich Nietzsche's religious affiliation you know, the physician who discovered nucleic acids in 1868, but he was a Swiss dude in the 1800s. So he was very likely religious and not an atheist, and I doubt that his finding had anything to do with his fate. However, if he would have been an atheist, 
he wouldn't have needed God to begin with and so nothing would have changed for him anyways. Usually researchers are far too busy asking themselves what something is and how it works to waste their valuable time on stupid questions like which sky did he create it? That's just not what they do. That's what you guys are here for. And I thought, that's the exact opposite of the conclusion I would draw. That's because you're not drawing a conclusion. You have your conclusion and you're looking for evidence to prove it. Suppose you, you, you found a way to decode, say, a Blu-ray disc. You have a way to decode Blu-ray discs. It's called a disc reader. And you say, wow, there's a lot of information on this Blu-ray disc. Obviously, this proves that this came about by accident. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the more complex something is, the more, the more you'd be inclined to think that it has a designer. Well, you can be inclined to believe whatever the hell you want, but that doesn't mean it's true. And the funny thing is, I've heard some of your fellow Christians, rightly, making that very same point to non-Christians, who, quite frankly, seem to have lost their marbles. However, unfortunately, instead of actually taking their advice and listening to things that are true, here you are doing exactly not that. How about you be the big boy, take the advice of your fellow Christians, and don't act like a massive hypocrite. And DNA being a molecule, a very long molecule, looks like a twisted ladder, and on the, on the rungs of this ladder are these nucleotide base pairs that encode all the proteins that make you in a way that we still don't fully understand. The level of intelligence that went into that the level of intelligence. If you converted DNA into computer code, you'd give every programmer in the world an aneurysm at once. That's how bad its coding is. We're now finding things about DNA that if you read it this way, you get some instructions, and you can read it backwards, and you get more instructions. Uh, no. Dude, you don't get to say that we hardly know anything about DNA, and then willy-nilly make a generalized claim on how you can take any sort of DNA and read it backwards and forwards to get different outcome. As though you know something about DNA. We know that some can be read front to back and back to front and give the same results. And we know that some DNA is utter gibberish front to back or back to front even for the organism it resides in. Also, if you try to emphasize the complexity of DNA, generalizing and simplifying it to the degree that you do seems a little bit counterproductive for your argument, doesn't it? I mean, that's astonishing. That'd be like, can you imagine somebody writing a book that when you turn it upside down and backwards, you can read it again and you get another story? Flipped by Wendelin von Dranen? Snark in a society. Even if I were to grant you all of your premises, it would still be a moot point. Because English is not a four nucleotide combination. It is a 26 letter language that can't make up its mind on how its letter combinations are even supposed to be pronounced. In other words, it is not the DNA that is beautifully good at being able to be read front to back and vice versa. It is the English language that is abysmally bad at it. And regardless of that obvious flaw, there are languages that can at times be read front to back and back to front and give you the same results. For example, let's think about maths and algebra. Whether you read A plus B is C or C equals B plus A does not matter. The result is the same. That's astonishing, the level of intelligence that went into that. Hmm. Well... You are very easy to impress. And so DNA is a very powerful confirmation of biblical creation. Whoa, 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 whoa. How do you get from <clears throat> super intelligent DNA to totally proves the story of my favorite book? I can't find any mention of DNA, RNA bacteria, or for that matter, any other discovery you approve of in the Bible of yours. Nor do I see anything of the how these things are made or how exactly they function. All there is, is a cloudy, vague, I did it sort of claim, and that's about it. And there are countless other fancy books that claim that too. We need more than just book says so, buddy. The same way we have more than Darwin says so to prove evolution. Alright, I'm gonna finish this another time. Maybe. If you like my video, please like, share and subscribe. If you really like what I do, Maybe consider supporting me on Patreon. These wonderful people are all the people who are supporting me already and I love them all so very much. I hope to see you soon and have a great evening. What the fuck is the Xerox machine?